Procedural animation. What is procedural animation? Is this procedural animation? What about this? Does it become animation if it's used to tell a story? Is a particle effect procedural? Is a fluid simulation animation? What about this fluid simulation? Despite the intro, I'll be focusing primarily on procedural animations such as for animals and robots, but I wanted to illustrate how what we call procedural animation depends just as much on the context it's being used in as in what's actually going on. We wouldn't typically call a particle effect a procedural animation, for instance, but a procedural animation is defined as an animation that is the simulation of motion through frames using a series of equations rather than frames drawn by an animator. Another example being a bouncing ball. We would consider this an interactable object, not a procedural animation. But it could be animated traditionally in a game, or it could be animated procedurally in a film. Regardless, these sorts of physics-based methods are the only ones that can really be described as completely procedural. With most techniques falling onto more of a sliding scale, from traditional to procedural. At the very top, we have shape keys being used as a kind of claymation. Then armature animations. Then we have armature animations that are built with inverse kinematics. In the middle, we have things like procedural gates using inverse kinematics or parkour systems as well as animated soft bodies such as active ragdoll systems. And finally at the very bottom we have things like physics simulations, which are completely procedural. As you can tell, the middle section there depends heavily on inverse kinematics. For a simple example of what this means exactly, imagine a robot arm and an object it wants to pick up. How can the arm move to pick up this object? Inverse kinematics is an algorithm that figures out how to solve this problem but it won't necessarily produce naturalistic motion as seen here. For example, if we grab an object with traditional animation, how it is done says a lot about the internal state of the character. Compare this to inverse kinematics where it's much more robotic and it doesn't give you any insight. What is this character feeling as he collects this object? Is he scared? He must be, right? Because he's in a horror game. But that's not shown by his animations. Think of your procedural animation as a chair and the inverse kinematics would be the screws that hold it together. There's a lot more to the chair than just screws. It's also not a cheat code to get things off faster. It's a lot more work than traditional animation. And in the time it takes you to set up an inverse kinematic system and set up procedural animation that doesn't fall apart, you could have already learned traditional animation in Blender and started implementing it. That said, inverse kinematics is also not something that requires a dumb high dumb high 189 iq q levels 189 if traditional animation is easier and more expressive why use procedural animation at all basically because circumstances are unpredictable for an easy example consider this animation of opening, opening a door i have this animation for opening a door but if i move the character to a different spot and play the animation it is no longer working correctly the character needs to be an exact spot for the animation to work you can also see this in Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. When Link needs to open a door, the game teleports him to where he needs to be to play this animation. Later games used inverse kinematics to modify animation, such as foot placement or Wind Waker. You can see Link's feet are properly on the steps. This was the new capability of the time and game studios were all adding this as a tech demo to their games. He can also open doors without teleporting. Small details like that are often handled procedurally. Another example being the hair simulation in Horizon Zero Dawn. This being a kind of mass spring system where it's based on correcting distances and iterating rather than on Hook's Law. And of course we can't forget parkour systems like in Assassin's Creed. These depend heavily on reverse kinematics to reach handholds. Essentially all these systems work the same. You have a sort of abstract animation where you move particles around and set those particles as targets for your inverse kinematic system. So in Assassin's Creed and similar games with climbing mechanics, the particles target handholds. While in a gate system, the particles are being moved around by, the, by a foot placement algorithm. When it's time to take a step, the particle interpolates in the next position, creating this kind of effect where the foot kind of slides across the ground. There's a fundamental issue where neither traditional nor procedural animation systems can handle walk cycles very well at all. For example, if you're going downhill, the normal force of the hill on your foot will move it through the gate cycle at a different speed than it would on a flat surface. And this really can't be captured by a traditional walk cycle. Similarly, how spongy the ground is, or the speed of gravity, or mass of the animal will change all it moves. Like how in the Apollo missions, people started bouncing around, because that's just how our limbs push energy into the ground. 
Similarly, the way that animals transition between gates is not at all captured by traditional animation blending, such as blend trees. The quadruped can walk, canter, trot, gallop, etc. But there's no halfways. There's no halfway between a block and a canter, as there would be if you tried to blend between them with a blend tree in Unity. As the animal speeds up, it will go from a fast walk and then suddenly pop into a slow canter with no sort of in-between. But this isn't the same as having no transition in animation, where they kind of pop between two keyframes. But animals do this to in minimize their energy expenditure. If we look at when they transition from a walk to a canter, and when they can't transition from a canter to a trot, these points are highly energetically unfavorable. This is why it's so hard to teach your dog to walk next to you on a leash. If you aren't walking at the exact natural pace of their gait, then for them it's like doing one of those walk and talk scenes in games where the NPC is slower than your run speed and faster than your walk speed and it's just hard to match their pace. And of course, this dynamic change is based on the size of the animal. In general, a tiny animal will never walk on a treadmill, it will instead ride to the back and then run towards the front. And a large animal does not behave the same as a small animal scaled up. They have different walk cycles because they have different physical dynamics in their bodies. Procedural gait systems are really hard and this becomes apparent as you look at the different intricacies of the animation. You can see how this dog's hips and shoulders rhythmically bounce in response to the steps. They sway back and forth as he walks too. His spine twists around. You can approximate this with a sine wave and do that kind of thing for your procedural animation as done here. But that won't be quite right in response to different circumstances. So it needs to be done with physical forces and then that becomes very unstable. So in many cases this just isn't handled at all. Take this example. This video showcases a procedural walk cycle where the transitions and obstacles are properly handled and focus on his spine and feet. His spine stays rigid and his feet just kind of slide forward in the next position, as I said before. Because it relies a lot on linear interpolation for foot placement. Compare that to these, these Looney Tunes clips, where the traditional animation is a lot more expressive. You can tell what this animal is feeling just by the way it moves. But the same is not true of any procedural walk cycle. How do games adapt animations for different characters? How most games handle lots of characters is to have a few animations that they use for everyone, where they have this set of animations that everyone plays because they have the same body layout This is very doable. But let's make some slight changes. As seen here, if I have this animation for digging a hole, and I make her legs longer, the shovel no longer reaches the ground. This is called retargeting, it's basically taking an animation that was meant for one character and applying it to another. It usually works, but sometimes you have these problems if the layout of the body is just a little bit too different. This gets even worse if the bones don't have similar names between the two rigs. If one is left hand and the other is hand L, the system may have trouble figuring this out. Although it has gotten a lot better at this kind of thing than it used to be, it still can't retarget between skeletons with different numbers of limbs can't retarget from a person to a dog. And if we look at AI-based solutions like this one by Adobe, it can generally only work on humanoids, and this one by Google will only produce very robotic motion. A very good hybrid approach to use is quite similar to how you'd use inverse kinematics to assess you in animating in Blender. For example, I can set up this inverse kinematics rig and manipulate where the eyes are looking just by moving this empty around that I've designated as a focal point. Or in this case, I can move the leg around, and this saves a lot of time for the animator. What if instead of baking the result at animation time and exporting that to the game, what if you just export these little target points moving around and then transform the game time to how you need them and then do your IK? Many of the problems with the retargeting get solved right away because of this, because there's a much smaller set of bones to worry about. It only matters that an arm is an arm, not if it has an endoskeleton or an exoskeleton or even no skeleton at all. The points are animated using traditional animation and algorithmically transformed based on the circumstances. We then target these points with inverse kinematics, and we have these nice animations that have the expressiveness of traditional animation and the adaptability of procedural animation. Creature Creator is a game that has a similar approach. You can see by looking through its code that when it animates, it functions by selecting something that it wants to target with inverse kinematics, just like how I target this in Blender, and then it applies a keyframe to it, unless the inverse kinematic system kind of figure out what to do. But this is no way to an make an animation. And the reason the animations are also simple in this game is that they have to be. When you write your animations by actually writing out to rotate by this much on this body, you don't have much ability to visualize how small changes will actually change how it looks. You don't have much ability to actually animate it artistically. It's all just programmer art. Another approach can be seen with Unreal Engine using control rate where you use a network of nodes to create procedural animations. 
This has very much the same problem. There's a lack of artistic control and a difficulty in visualizing how these nodes will produce changes in the look and feel of animation. Enter Spark, a program made specifically for creating animations for these full body IK systems. It works in much the same way the animations in Spore did, by creating a generalized animation file that can be specialized to work on any creature. So for example, we can create an external target representing a fruit and move the hand over to it. Because the animation is defined in terms of hand and fruit, it doesn't really matter where we move the fruit to. The animation still plays just fine. We can further adjust the curve so we arc over to the fruit instead of just robotically reaching towards it as with prior solutions. So the game engine can set where the external target is and we can use Spark to author the way the appendage will arc over to the object. Similarly, in this case of hitting the ground, it's defined in terms of arms and ground. So it doesn't matter what character I apply to or how far they are from the ground, the character will still hit the ground. Or in this case where I have many models playing a handshake animation. Despite having very different armatures, they play the same animation. Even if they don't all have hands, Spark lets us author conditions into the animation to control a variety of circumstances. Wrapping up our exploration of procedural animation. It's apparent that procedural animation is a cornerstone of flexible game design, but also that it isn't a binary choice between traditional and procedural animation. Rather, procedural animation is best used alongside traditional animation to enhance it and make it more flexible. 